So today I'm going to tell you a story about evolution. And in particular, the moral of this story is the fact that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And the type of biology I'm going to be talking about is actually, it's called the cis regulatory network. And I'm going to look at it from an evolutionary perspective using population genetics. And I call the extension of population genetics to cis regulatory networks population regulomics. So the story starts, obviously, with introducing what is a cis regulome. Well, luckily enough, Mark gave us a pretty good uh, introduction to binding sites and genetic and gene regulation. So the cis regulome, you, you can think of the genome as your collection of genes, and the cis regulome is going to be the collection of regulatory interactions within the cell. And it's a critical piece in the input-output program that a cell implements. And in fact, for decades now, we've been trying to mine these out of the cell. And the beautiful thing about the cis regulome is the fact that it's actually written in DNA. So you can identify short sequences in non-coding regions called binding sites. Uh, Mark's tools would help us and then identify what these binding sites, what type of regulatory interactions they encode. And in fact, these binding sites exist in large regions of DNA called non-coding DNA. So the cis regulome, it began uh, just with what we could enumerate. So it started very small about a decade ago, uh, or over a decade ago. And since then, new, tech, new high throughput technologies have allowed us to enumerate thousands of genes interacting within the cell. So these, the cis regulome is a very complicated network with a lot of interacting parts. So how did we originally make sense of the cis regulome and why is evolution, of, why are we talking about evolution? Well, first I want to explain how, we're, how we've looked at the cis regulome without the light of evolution. And it starts with taking the cis regulome and turning it into a network. So this is a pretty foundational work about a decade ago by Yuri Alone's lab. They took the E. coli regulatory network, they encoded it, um, and they extracted out what are called motifs, which are just significant, significantly over, overrepresented subgraphs in the network. And so you need to have some sort of null model, so they used a random graph model, just an edge switching model, and they found what are called motifs, and a decade of, of studies have gone through, and they found that these motifs seem to execute, execute uh, sophisticated temporal programs, right? And it's, it seems really beautiful because you can layer these motifs together and actually put together very complicated functioning circuits. Um, and so the result of that is people saying, well, this is gorgeous. Like, we have these really cis complicated cis-regulatory networks, but they're organized in a really nice way because they have motifs in them. And because of that, well, we think that it might be adaptive, right? And that's why we see them everywhere, because evolution is a beautiful process, and it's creating nice functional circuits. And you don't have to look far. People are still talking about it, you know, just a couple years ago. So the theory would tell us that we can draw these networks like circuit diagrams, right? You can actually, once you uh, enumerate the cis regulatory network out, you can make these beautiful diagrams, um, something akin to an engineering circuit. But the beautiful, the interesting thing about biology is we're continuing to, the, to develop new technologies to actually understand these networks better, and we're finding that this isn't the case. So uh, just as an example of one of these experiments, I, as my, um, on my practicum to LBNL, I worked with the Arkin Lab, and they were working on a really neat experiment where they were knocking out every single gene and looking at how important it was to the cell and how much it was expressed. So how important a gene is to, excel, uh, to the cell can be measured in the knockout effect, which is just the growth, the growth rate of the cell without that gene. And then also the expression level, so how much of that gene product was turned on. Now the surprising thing is the majority of genes were expressed without actually being needed. This was really surprising. They didn't expect this at all. They maybe expected five, ten percent of genes, but not the majority of genes being turned on without actually being needed by the cell. So what, th what does this mean? Well, the theory doesn't match the evidence. We have this theory for how these networks are put together, but we're not actually seeing that in the, in the empirical evidence from a wet lab. 
So obviously there's an opportunity here, right? So we need to actually bridge what's going on in these cis-regulatory networks and their construction and the evidence we're getting from them, how they're actually working. So this is a story about evolution, and the moral of the story is that we need to look at it from an evolutionary perspective. So to do that, let's start at the beginning with Darwin. So when I talk about evolution, most people understand evolution as Darwinism. So Darwinism is built around the idea of natural selection. And natural selection is built on three main tenets. First, that more offspring are produced than can survive in a generation. That there is some sort of variation within that population. And lastly, that that trait variation could be inherited. Now, it's interesting, when Darwin came up with this theory, he didn't actually understand why there was genetic variation in the population. In fact, if natural selection worked, it would clear out all sort of variation in the population. You'd be left with one ultimate individual. And lastly, he had no idea of the biomechanisms involved in actually transferring traits from one generation to the next. It wasn't until the early 1900s that a model and math developed which could actually help answer these questions. And this is called population genetics. And population genetics um, puts together a theoretical framework for understanding evolution and quantifying it. You can think of it as like the ab initio understanding of how evolution works. So in particular, uh, it developed ways for calculating how genetic variation uh, changes uh, throughout um, a population's lifetime and where that variation can come from. So what is population genetics? I just wanted to give you a, a brief touch on it. I think a lot of people don't actually know about it. Uh, <clears throat> it's built around, obviously, trying to uh, describe evolution and mathematically, rigorously explain how these traits can change over time. So we have a generational life cycle in which uh, four major processes take place. We have mutation, recombination, selection, and drift. So population genetics, as its name, deals with populations. So here we have a population, and each individual is a circle. So this is a very small population. And the specific uh, genetic material of that population is, is uh, indicated by its color. So a genotype, for instance, all the blue genotypes are individuals with the same genetic material. If we advance to the next generation, just by random chance, you'll have some individuals produce more offspring than others. <clears throat> and we can see the line of descent with these arrows from the first generation to the second generation. And this process continues. And what's interesting is, over time, you may actually lose alleles or genotypes in your population, not because they were less fit, just because you have repeated sampling over long periods of time. So this is really a sampling effect. Now this is actually an extremely powerful force in evolution. And this is what's considered uh, a neutral force because it's not operating with any function. It, it operates regardless of the genetic material harbored in these individuals. Now if we include mutation into the picture, we have genetic drift operating, but at some point uh, a new genotype may arise and that will happen because of a mutation. So in this case, when the mutation pops up, it's considered a neutral mutation, meaning it doesn't actually confer any beneficial advantage to the individual. If we follow this through time, it will fluctuate as we would expect by random chance. Now, if we include selection, which is what most people think of as evolution, most people just think of selection, it's just one force in all of these uh, complicated processes. So we continue through, here's our first mutant. Well, we get a second mutant. And this, is, this second mutant actually has some sort of adaptive advantage. And so this would be reflected, the frequency of this genotype in the, in the ultimate population would be reflective of the fact that it did have an adaptive advantage over the other uh, individuals in the population. So this is how we look at problems from a population genetics perspective. Realistically, these populations would be much larger and the genetic material in them may be complicated. So we, could, we can imagine sampling down here each individual's DNA sequence, right? And we can use that sequence to then infer properties about the population. So this is what we're going to do with networks. And we can see here the advantage that the, uh, the gray diamond evolved. 
So the cis regulum, we want to do this for the cis regulum, right? So uh, the cis regulum is a key piece of uh, the cellular machinery, and it's made of three important parts from a modeling perspective. We have the binding site, the transcription factor that binds on the binding site, and the amount of non-coding DNA that in, in which binding sites may occur. So from a modeling perspective, we have three main uh, parameters we need to take into account, specifically the binding sites, the amount of non-coding DNA per gene, and those transcription factors. So we can build uh, a sequence representation of what's going on in the biology, where we have the non-coding DNA ahead of the genes and then binding sites, which may uh, occupy these spots. And then from this, we can actually develop a network representation. So as part of this, we need to develop some sort of sophisticated models for handling the fact that binding sites are actually complicated patterns, which we do, uh, so we can handle actually real data. And as part of this, in order to ha <laughs> handle uh, large networks, uh, I had to devise a novel compression scheme. It's a real-time compression scheme so that we could handle networks the size of, for instance, E. coli's 500 node network. And actually, I was able to achieve uh, two orders of magnitude improvement in the size of the network that could be simulated. So in terms of how do we actually use this new model in the population genetics context, well, we take our, secret, our representation of the network, we stick it in an initial population, we simulate over long periods of time, and then we get a distribution down here. And this distribution is actually our null distribution. And we can use that to assess the properties of cis regulatory networks. So this is what I did for E. coli. I went back uh, basically to that uh, study about a decade ago and I revisited the problem with this new model. And I said, what would we expect these cis regulatory networks to be? So I parameterized it with real data. And uh, the E. coli network, for instance, has 1,000 interactions and 595 operons. And I developed a distribution of 1,000 random E. coli networks. That would be the result of neutral evolution. And because we have a distribution of networks, we can calculate network properties on them, like what are the motifs in them, uh, their clustering coefficient, degree distribution, things like that. Basically, I was able to show that 91% of interactions actually fall under neutral expectations. So unlike previous work, which would say that these networks are largely formed by adaptive processes, I would say that about 91% of them are formed by neutral processes. This is a paradigm shift in how we actually view these cis-regulatory networks. I was also able to show that uh, popular network motifs, like what are called feed-forward loops, actually uh, arise with the same expectation you would expect with chance, just neutral evolution. So we were able, in the end, to quantify these neutral trends in the network in a real network, which no one really was able, ever able to do. Uh, and, and so I would finally say that we have theory now that matches the evidence we're getting back from these regulatory networks. And, and this kind of work helps uh, give us an idea of what's really going on and what's forming these networks. So the conclusions, I think population regulomics is a valuable extension to population genetics. I didn't show you the analytical part, but there's, there's a whole set of also measures and calculations you can run on these, on these cis regulatory networks. Uh, I think it's also useful revisiting current perspectives from an evolutionary perspective. I think we, we have a lot of adaptive mirages, and what we think might be adaptive is actually just neutral evolution at work. And then I think there's uh, potential for wide application um, of these kind of studies in looking at how evolution would change and affect your systems. So with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Louis Nakle, uh, the Arkin, Arkin Lab, and the DOE CSGF.